Thank you, Slate. Let's see. I'm trying to share the screen here. Oh, do I do I need to make you the host? It's I see it. It says uh, when I click share screen, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, yeah. Let me enable you. I'm gonna make you the host. Okay. Okay, you should be able to do it now. All right, so, hey everybody, today I am the, uh, no, sorry, <laughs> um, today I am the Table Topics Master, um, and so for the activity today, I wanted to do it based off of a cartoon I've been watching, which is the Clone Wars Star Wars, or the Star Wars Clone Wars that my brother recommended to me that is really good, and I really enjoy it. Um, but at the beginning of every episode, it, it has kind of like an inspirational uh, quote that um, kind of sets the stage for the whole episode. And I always kind of enjoyed that part. And so the quotes are pretty, uh, pretty deep because, you know, it's kind of like about good versus evil and the Jedi versus the Sith. Um, so hopefully these questions aren't too deep, but I hope you guys like it. And um, yeah, let's get into it. <laughs> So, the winding path to peace is always wor a worthy one, regardless of how many, um, how many turns it takes. Describe something that brings you peace in your life. I can take this one, Courtney. All right. So, something that brings me peace in my life. I think just getting outdoors away from all the buzz of my regular life. It would be as simple as going to my backyard and just down with one of my dogs or going on a full planned hiking trip. I think just getting outdoors with nature, feeling the ground beneath your feet, seeing some greenery of the trees and the local life. I think that's what brings me peace in my life. I think you need to go outside and see that there's a lot to see out there. Because I think I don't do that as often as I should anymore. I really, I was a Boy Scout and I used to go outside all the time doing backpacking trips, camping. And I try to say that I'm, I love to do that stuff, but you know, especially of course given what's going on now, but even before that last year, I really didn't do that enough, even though that's, that is what brings peace in my life. So just going outdoors, be on the ground beneath your feet, and listen to those birds chirp. Thanks, Courtney. Awesome, yeah, great. I, I totally agree. Being outside is so just calming and centering. It's definitely something that, that brings me peace also. All right. All right, so the best confidence uh, builder is experience. So describe something that you feel really experienced and confident doing. Uh, I can take this one, Courtney. Can I go ahead? Sorry. Yes. Great. Thanks. <laughs> so describe the time. Wait, so which one am I answering? Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Like I said, describe something that you feel experienced and confident doing. Um, so for me, I would say really uh, speaking. I honestly, I mean, Toastmasters, so this is really a good look being like, oh, he's confident at speaking and stuff. He's a Toastmaster. Those things are add up. But when I mean speaking, I don't mean like, rehearse speeches. So whenever I try to research a speech or like try to really find out what I'm going to talk about, I really fail at it. I don't know why. Like if I have a research topic and they're like present about this topic, I always fail. I have no idea what I'm doing. But if I'm supposed to just like present an idea or try to captivate someone, a lot of people have been telling me that I have like some really good skills 
and I'm able to do that. Like for example, for school assignments, I don't look at my, any of my school assignments until the day of, if I have like a speech or presentation, I don't even look at the PowerPoint. But once I'm up to the, I'm able to make something happen and make something work just through the sheer will of my, I don't know, my character, my speaking ability, or the way I'm able to simply input words to make myself sound smart. So I think honestly, this goes hand in hand. It's not just speaking, but I can just make myself sound smarter than I actually am. But that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> Um, but that was a great job. Yeah, and I, I definitely, when I saw your speech and when you're speaking, I definitely see that's definitely something you have a knack for. So, yeah. Um, let's see. So, sorry, how do you go, like, back and forth? It might be an arrow at the bottom left corner. Oh, okay, perfect. Um, okay, so facing off. One, one second. Let me. Just... Okay. Facing all that you fear will free you from yourself. Uh, so when was the time you had to face one of your fears? I guess I can go. Great, awesome. Okay. When was the time I had to face one of my fears? <laughs> I think crossing streets was pretty scary. <laughs> um, I, I, I yeah, let me organize. When I first crossed a street, and it was a, a busy street, it was a, a two-way intersection, so that means that, um, you know, one way has the, the right-of-way, the perpendicular street usually, or it doesn't have to be, anyway, one street has the right-of-way and the other street has to stop, and I was crossing over the one that had the right-of-way, so cars was going, and that was, that was terrifying, because, I was just wondering, when's the next car coming? When, I don't know, it was just scary. And things, cars would sound distant because it was an interstate a couple blocks away. So like, oh, I hear a car. And then, you know, it'd be on the interstate. And I'd just be standing there for 10 minutes. So eventually, you know, there are times that you just have to kind of go for it um, and do my best. And so, so times like that have been scary. Also, dealing with streets that have um, what are called turn islands. So they're usually six lane roads. And then you have this island in the middle, and you're somehow supposed to know to turn. I'm assuming there's a sign, um, but it doesn't really help me. Uh, those are also pretty terrifying, and just trying to make sure that I'm oriented correctly. So definitely whenever I'm faced with one of those, having to overcome that fear and just take deep breaths. And the last thing I'll say is one of the key things my instructors taught me when I was crossing the street was he noticed that when I cross, I, I would stop breathing and I would veer, you know, to the left, to the right. I wouldn't go straight. So Justin, just breathe. Just when you're walking across the street or, you know, at a fast pace, just breathe, take deep breaths. And as soon as I did that, my street crossings totally changed. So breathing is important. Always keep breathing whenever facing your face. Thank you so much. Wow, great. Yeah, I definitely can imagine can imagine what type of experience. Well, I can't imagine at all, but but yeah, I mean, that was great advice that you got. I mean, it's true. There's so many things. It's just, you know, just breathe. Breathe and, and try to, you know, take it on. Um, all right, so there is no path before you. Um, if there is no path before you, create your own. Describe a time when you created an opportunity for yourself. I can take this one as well, Courtney. So, time I create opportunity for myself really would have to be with Toastmasters. I really sought out involvement in a club 
is how I started back in spring 2019. And I was a general member, and I actually ran for, at the end of that, my first semester, officer role, sergeant at arms. And I lost, understandably, since it was my first semester there. And I think I was, was competing against, actually held the role beforehand. I learned well after. But nonetheless, I stayed the semester after, because I, I like Toastmasters. It's a really great club. And then an opportunity came up. Because I made myself so involved and so showed so much effort in the club, officer role actually came up because someone left. So I became VP PR for the rest of that year. And throughout that year, I actually made another opportunity for myself of the role of presidency that I hold now. I saw that we were kind of dwindling in numbers because almost our entire officer team was graduating, going to leave. So I was really worried for the health of the club. And naturally, throughout that spring semester, I started to really step up and start taking steps to see what we needed to get done to prepare for summer and moving on from there. But really, I just have to say, my time as an officer here in Toastmasters, I really made myself, I saw that opportunity, and I started making that hole bigger and jumped right into it. So I just like to say that to everyone else, if you see something, go for it. You can expand on it, it's possible. So thank you, Courtney. Awesome, great. Yeah, I mean, I'm new to Toastmasters, but you guys do a great job here. So so yeah, I mean, it's awesome how, how you've taken on the president role here. Um, all right, let's. All right, so who you were does not have to define who you are. What is something that you used to do, believe, express in high school that is different from today? Um, I can take that one. All right, so in high school, um let's see i used to think that um if i weren't making all a's or all a's and like maybe one or two b's that i wasn't really going to be successful and i kind of sort of put that pressure on myself all of the, all of the time but then when i got to college and i saw how hard and how relentlessly i had to work to make a b minus Boy, that was one of the best feelings in my life, man. <laughs> to to see your grade go from like a like a seventy one average to an eighty one average over one test that you study for so hard for for at least like two weeks for it's like the best feeling in the world. So for me, it was just that from high school, I was always sort of picky on my grades. I would always judge my performance based off of my grades. And it was sort of depressing whenever I would make bad grades. But now in college, I don't necessarily, I know it, you're supposed to judge yourself and other people judge yourself based on your grades. And that's how you get different opportunities and different jobs. But for me, um, I don't necessarily judge myself based off of my grades exactly, but I judge myself based off of how I took that class, how I responded to the challenges that I faced while I was taking the class and just how, how much effort did I put in the class and how much did I learn in the class? Because there are some classes in college that I've made A's and great grades and I don't remember much about the class. And there are some classes that I, I barely made a B minus and I remember a lot about the class. So for me, it's, it's less about the grade now and it's more about understanding the material. And yes, we need good grades in order to like find jobs and stuff, but it's not all about the grades for me like it was in high school. So I think that's just one thing that changed from high school to now to college. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, that's great. I mean, if you, you've learned that lesson, then you're going to do amazing because, I mean, school's all about, really, it's all about trying to become an independent learner. And if you value learning more than a grade, yeah, that's awesome. All right, so the whys benefit from a second opinion. 
what is something you would consult another person on before making a final decision? I can go, but I just need to think. I definitely do this a lot. I just don't know. I need to think. Yeah. Got 10 seconds. No. <laughs> um, okay. <clears throat> I have a council of people. I believe that I am not capable of making decisions without others. Now, what I mean by that is I can make a basic decision most of the time, like eat breakfast. Uh, if, if a choice is presented in front of me, I can do it. But the long-term, greatly impactful decisions I find impossible to make without the counsel of others. So I, I have a network of people that I call for these things. Some of these things include relationship stuff, uh, even just basic things. You know, am, am I seeing things clearly? Am I not respecting this person well enough? Do I need to create a boundary with this person to set a, you know, to keep this relationship intact? If so, how do I do that? It's so crucial to me to have that counsel's input. Another area for me would be spiritual. My spiritual life is is also run by a council, uh, basically. And there's a head of that council who's my priest. And I go to my priest and say, "Hey, um, you know, am I, you know, how should I be lengthening my prayers? Am I am I praying too much? Um, what do I do in this situation? How do I surrender my will over to God? You know, that's that's a crucial fact. I, I don't think it's possible." For me to live a spiritual life without the guidance of, of others, um, especially my priest, and um, and of course in blindness as well. I, I hate I'm using the blind card, but it really is relevant. Uh, it's it, am I having too low expectations for myself? Am I having too are my expectations too high for myself? Am I being prideful by rejecting help? the situation or is this an, an, a good example of independence i think that it, in my personal experience my view just gets so clouded by everything and my own thoughts and my own emotions and that it's impossible for me to see clearly without someone shining a light in the fog because my brain gets fogged so thank you so much and back to you table topics master Thank you. Nice. Yeah, I, I like the way that you said that you have a council that you use. It reminds me of a in a book that I read that was all about success that said you should always have like a mastermind group for all of your, your important decisions. And, you know, if you can bounce ideas off of people, you're, you're going to ultimately make the best decision for yourself. So that's awesome. Um, let's see. Uh, so um, ad adaption is key is the key to survival. Describe a time when significant changes occurred in your life and how did you adapt to that situation? Um, I guess I could take this one. Let's see, adapting to significant change in my life um let's see i guess one big adaption that happened recently was me transferring to uga so i transferred to uga from georgia state and for me it was really hard because i didn't know at the time that transferring will be as hard as it was for me to be able to just meet people and get the gist of everything and understand the different vibes and the different student organizations and just the different groups. I didn't realize that that would be so hard because it wasn't hard at state. And so how did I adapt? I adapted by kind of putting myself out there 
more than usual. It was kind of weird to me at first, but then I realized that that was like the only way for me to get to know people and for people to get to know me because a lot of people already had their friend groups and stuff. So it was sort of like really hard, but um, I guess it, in, it ended up working out because I ended up, you know, finding my friends and joining different student organizations like Toastmasters, which was really cool. I was able to meet a lot of people. And I think it's just very important that like, if you have a goal, you try and go out of your comfort zone to reach it no matter what, because um, no one is going to go out of their way for you and do it. You have to do it yourself. And so for me, it was just being able to go out of my comfort zone and meet different individuals and just meet as many people as I can, get their contact, get their social media, just in case I run into them again. I can say, oh, hey, how are you doing? Do you remember me? And before you know it, I have that connection with you. And so that's just a big thing that helped me adapt to transfer into UGA. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, I, uh, I I also transferred from community college from the University of Colorado in undergrad. So I totally feel you. It is so weird to to start two years at one school and then or however many years and then finish off at a totally new place with different people and different culture. Um, but yeah, it seems like you've, you've made a home here. So awesome. All right, so survival is one step on the path to living. What is something um, you live for that is not essential to survival? I added some kind of vague tips at the bottom, if that helps anybody. <laughs> uh, I can take this one. All right. So something I live for other than just like my pure survival. So surviving and just thriving, and it's very basic, but well, it's pretty nice, I guess, being able to eat food and just like living your days off. But honestly, the thing I really look forward to and what really drives me is knowing that at the end of the day, you have to make something out of yourself. You wanna be remembered. You wanna be remembered for something greater and have some sort of impact around the people around you or people in general. So I just think about in like a future tense, what will my, for example, children think of me in, let's say 20 years, what will my grandchildren think of me? What will society think of me? What will I be remembered as or for? Because in my honest opinion, we all have a choice. We can all make some sort of impact, whether it be small scale, whether it be um, a bit larger, like on city scale, whether it be like international scale, we can all make an impact if we honestly try to go ahead and do what we want. And so I feel like going after just surviving and being like, oh, everything's all right, not wanting to go do the next thing, scale the next mountain, go explore, do what makes you want to do. Basically, try to become a better person and try to reach that next mile. Try to go ahead with your life. Don't just remain in stagnancy by just living, because living is the bare minimum that you have to do in this life. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly that hits the the nail on the. How do you say that? I don't even know how that that statement goes. <laughs> Anyways, but yeah, uh, there's so much more to life than just survival, and and yeah, you know, feeling like you've done something at the end of your life, and and going after the things that you love is super important. Yeah, awesome. What is lost is often found. Describe a time when you lost or found something. I'll take this one, Courtney. All right. When I lost and found something was my wallet. And this was bad for a couple of reasons. I kept my at the time, this was a couple of years ago, my learner's permit in there, my military ID, my dad was in the Navy, and I think I had a nice crisp $20 bill in there. So it was very unfortunate. I lost it one day. So I couldn't go driving because I needed to get the driving practice so I could go do my road test, actually get my real license. So I was pretty devastated. Just weeks and weeks go by, and eventually we're like, okay, I need to, I need to have my permit to actually drive, but when they get caught without it, that's obviously be really bad. 
and illegal. So we went out all the way to the driving, you know, DMV, got the new, had to pay the 10 bucks it was for the permit. Then, of course, the next day, down in my room, stuck in my chair, my wallet, right after I'd found it. So I lost it and then found it right when I went to go replace the things inside it. Thankfully, before I started replacing everything, I'd found it. But nonetheless, I now have two copies of a learner's permit, which, of course, are completely useless now. And that was a hard $10 lesson. But in the end, I found it. So uh, it all worked out. And my mom definitely said I'd be paying for the next one if something like that happened again. Thanks, Courtney. Yeah, it's the worst when you lose something. And it's even worse when you find it and you're like, oh man, it was if I just looked in this one place and I wouldn't have gone through so much trouble, but but it happens. So <laughs> all right. Embrace others for their differences, for that makes you whole. Describe a quality in a friend or loved one that you cherish because it helps you to see life from a different perspective. I can take this one. Uh, I have a friend who is opposite from me in almost every way I can think of. Uh, he is, well, I guess I'll right then. <laughs> he is uh, he's African American. He's, um, he's gay. He's an atheist. And generally on the far left of the spectrum, he's also an artist, which I don't understand art at all. Um, just, I'm not even remotely interested. I never was good at, you know, doing the art thing when I was a kid. Uh, so talking to him is, is always interesting. And we always get into these really intellectual just conversations about bizarre things. And it, it's just fascinating because he learned something from me and I learned something from him. It's someone that when people see me with him, we kind of joke about their, their reaction is, it's probably just extremely bizarre. I mean, we, we don't look like we would we would go together. I'm I'm you know straight white male, uh, you know an Orthodox Christian. Uh, so you know it just it doesn't make sense on paper, but it truly is an enriching experience and helps. It, it forces me to think when we have these conversations about different topics and our our disagreements and beliefs. You know, I have to think about lots of things in different ways to try to explain a concept outside of my bubble. So I enjoy that experience and, and that's why I think diversity is valuable in, in having those connections with people and those friendships. So that way when I'm making a statement about an issue or, I can, or making a point about something, I'm not just coming at it from that abstract perspective, I'm coming at it in, when also considering the feelings of the person involved. Not having those feelings drive the uh, opinion itself, but making sure that I'm aware of how it will personally impact people that will be affected by whatever I'm saying. So thank you so much. Back to you, Table Topic Semester. Awesome. Yeah, it's always, it's always crazy when you have like a friend of like a different race and a different like sexuality and just to be able to like you know see their life for what it is and and you know learn so much from them and they learn from you and yeah so that's awesome where we are going always reflects where we came from describe something from your early life that you feel has shaped who you are today I can do this one. All right, awesome. 
Uh, so not many people know this, but I have a twin brother. So the problem with having a twin is that you're always seen like as a package deal, right? You just always like come in pairs. So for me, honestly, as I grew up, I always began to see myself as like a pair of a larger part. I really didn't try to go out, do my own thing. I mean, it, I could do my own thing, but it was just like you felt more comfortable being in the same class as just hanging out together and things like that. So honestly, coming to college has really been a wake up call for me because I've able to do things on my own and able to branch out and try to promote my own individuality. So it makes me feel as though I have to protect my individuality at a greater cost. So I don't, for example, like dressing the same as he does anymore. So if we accidentally wear the same shirt, I'm, I go up to him and I'm like, change your shirt right now. Cause I just have this like innate thing. My parents are like, Oh, you guys should wear the same thing. It'll be cute. Like when you're little and I'm like, no, 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 no. Cause like in my head, I just can't let that little fragile tinge of my individuality just die out since it's been like dead since I was in like elementary school and things. And I'm like trying to be like, I'm an individual. I have, I can do my thing. So I guess that would be my ultimate thing that has shaped me. And I feel like that's really changed how I view the world and really impacted how I view things because I think see things through a larger perspective instead of through just like an individualistic perspective. But yeah, thank you. Yeah, I bet having a twin would definitely affect feeling like, you know, you're trying to be an individual. And most of the twins I know are like, are actually kind of embrace like trying to be the same person so it's interesting that you're like you're like nah like we're gonna be totally different people and wear different things like <laughs> that's really cool though <laughs> all right so you must trust in others or success is impossible um describe a time when you put your trust in someone else or vice versa Um, I guess I can take this one. So, uh, when did I put my trust in someone else? I think that's the question. So, there was once this group project um, that, that I had with a friend. And this friend was unfortunately known for not getting their work done on time. So, um, we had the project. Uh, it was sort of some sort of math project. And it was actually pretty, it was a pretty hard project. And usually I would do my part and do the other person's part. So in case the other person doesn't do our part, it's there and we'll just put it together and call it a day because I can't risk my grade for somebody else. So, you know, we got the project, we started doing it. I did my part. He did his part, surprisingly. And we came up to present it. And, you know, it was surprising. It was, it was like a dream come true. I was so surprised. And so I just think that sometimes, um, the reason, I guess the reason why I made sure he did this part is because I communicated to him and I told him how important this project it means to me. And, you know, he just wants to get finish school and move on. But for me, it was just a really important project. And it was like a determinant factor for me to get into some sort of program that I wanted to get into. And so I was just sort of like communicative with him. And before you know it, he came through. He came through on his side 100%. Everything was good. He practiced and everything. It was just great to have someone, um, to believe in someone and to trust them and for them to fulfill their part. That's, just, that's the best thing that happened. And so we were successful in the project and we made an A on it. And case closed in the story. Thank you so much. Yes, group projects are the worst, <laughs> but that's awesome. When, when, when the group comes through and you're not doing the whole project by yourself, that is such a good feeling. <laughs> but um, it looks like um, we are going to stop there since everybody has gone through three times. Um, and so I guess I will um, pass it along um, back to sleep. All right. 
Thank you, Courtney, for the tabletop section. Uh, sure as the general evaluator will say, you did an amazing job. I think this is something we could draw inspiration from for future ones. I think you did a great example of what to do for table topic section. And we'll also take a quick minute to minute and a half intermission, give time to leave feedback for Courtney. It's her first time as table topic master leading the table topics. You can say she did great, if you liked her questions and her theme, or how she could improve for next time. Any feedback I'm sure she would appreciate. We're all here to learn and become better speakers. And you can also continue to leave me feedback for me as Toastmaster. And so I'll go ahead and start the clock for one minute. Actually, while we do that, yes, so keep doing that. I'll also put up all the speakers I wrote down, all the topics we will vote on first and second place speakers. So, yep, that's what we'll do. Okay, so not necessarily very prettily organized, but I listed table topic speaker, the three topics they spoke on, and then next speaker, the three topics they spoke on for all four of us that spoke. We each did three different top topics. So please, like previous meetings, switch the to everyone to Noah and put your first and second favorite table talk speaker to vote for and make sure all five of us vote and we'll give another quick 15 seconds to finish voting for that now that all those are up Okay, 
Make sure to continue getting those votes in if you haven't already. And we'll now move on to the third and final section of our meeting, the evaluation section. This section will be led by our general evaluator, Soren, and he'll tell you more about how he'll evaluate today.